Welcome back. We are almost to the point where we are finished with this first period of time in U.S. history that's gone from the colonies through the revolution, the growth of the country, and has ended with the Civil War. But before we finish it all out, we have to deal with the aftermath of the Civil War, at least in the South. We have to deal with this thing called Reconstruction. There's actually two lessons here. Uh, this one is going to take you through the early years of Reconstruction, tell you what it was that the North wanted to accomplish. So let's go ahead and get right into it. We'll start with that question, what exactly is Reconstruction? And very simply, it is the readmission of the Southern states to the Union because of the Civil War, because they said they had left. They are now going to have to go through a process uh, to get back in. Now, it doesn't matter if you believe that there's no such thing as secession. They have caused the Civil War. They have to pay some kind of penance. It is going to be administered by the federal government, so the government of Washington, D.C. is going to set the rules and set the standards. And because of that, Republicans being in charge of the northern government, uh, they're going to lay out their big goals for Reconstruction. What exactly is it that they wanted to do? And really, there are four main goals. The first one is they wanted, of course, to restore the Union. The problem with this one is uh, it's kind of ambiguous. How do you know that you've restored the Union? You, uh, you eliminate uh, that uh, divisiveness between the two sides, between North and South. It's very difficult to do, especially in the aftermath of the war. The second thing they wanted to do is they wanted to reshape or rebuild Southern society. Southern society had uh, been established with, you know, slave labor as kind of the, the basis of society. There was a very small middle class. You had a plantation-owning ruling class. And then you had a lot of poor whites. That needs to change because we no longer want the, the plantation owners who started the Civil War running the show. They also want to make sure that the rights of the former slaves, who are going to be called the freedmen, and I'll cover this here in just a minute, uh, they wanted to make sure that those people had their rights protected. They also wanted to make sure that the overall Southern society and political system was more equitable for all people. Of course, Reconstruction also implies kind of a physical rebuilding of the South. The South has been left in ruins, so, so that needs to be taken care of. And then lastly, they also wanted to establish the Republican Party in the South. This is a purely political motive. The Republican Party was a regional party. It didn't exist in the South prior to the Civil War. And so what the Republican Party wants to do is they want to make sure they're a nationwide party, that they can appeal to more voters. And so they're hoping to do that by you know, tapping into certain segments of Southern society and saying, we want you to vote for us. So as we start looking at Reconstruction, we need to start, we need to start with what the North wanted to do. During the middle of the Civil War, Congress came up with its own plan for Reconstruction through something called the Wade Davis Bill, named for the two sponsors of the bill in the House and the Senate. This plan was specifically designed to punish the South for starting the Civil War. Okay? This is, depending on how you want to look at this, is, this is a more vengeful plan. They want to control the South, because the thing with Reconstruction is, until you as a state were able to finish out whatever it was the North had required you to do, uh, you're under their dominion. You're under their jurisdiction. So the Wade Davis bill is going to say, in order to be fully reconstructed, you have to do a couple things. Number one, 50% of your voters from 1860 have to swear allegiance to the Union. And anyone who had supported the Confederacy will not be allowed to participate in this number. In other words, you voted in 1860, you were an eligible voter in 1860, 
but because you aided the South, they're not going to let you participate. So you can't count in that 50%. And then what they do is their interpretation of who is a Confederate includes not only the leadership, but also the common ordinary people who maybe had been drafted into the military, the people who had worked for the Confederate Postal Service. If you had sold materials to the Confederacy, or if you had taken IOUs for the Confederate, you were considered to be a Confederate and therefore unable to participate in this. That is done on purpose because statistically it's impossible to get to that 50% number so close after the Civil War, which means that the southern states are going to be under northern jurisdiction for a long period of time. The second thing the Wade Davis bill required was it required the southern states to repudiate or renounce or cancel any debts that they had incurred during the Civil War. What that means is they have to look at the people they've borrowed money from and tell them they will not be repaying that, that any debt they owe is officially wiped out. And you might think, well, this is a good deal for the southern states because now they don't have any debt. The problem with it is they also have no money. And so in order to accomplish many of the things that states have to accomplish, they need to borrow money. And what the North is asking them to do, what the North is telling them to do, is destroy their credit history. That's what that number two is. The third thing they had to do, of course, is they had to outlaw slavery. Now, by the end of 1865, the states had ratified the 13th Amendment outlawing slavery throughout the country. However, they wanted the states to write this into their state constitutions that slavery was outlawed. The Wade Davis bill is going to be debated in 1863. It's passed by Congress in 1864. Abraham Lincoln doesn't like this, though. He doesn't like this plan for Reconstruction. And so he's going to use a political maneuver called a pocket veto. We should be familiar with the veto, where the president uh, essentially writes across the bill that he vetoes it and he, he formally rejects it. A pocket veto is a little bit different. A pocket veto, when Congress passes a bill, the rules set out in the Constitution say the president has 10 days to sign the bill into law. If he does not sign it into law, if he does not sign it, it becomes law anyway. This keeps the president from just saying, I'm not going to sign it and letting bills stack up. However, to keep Congress from rushing bills through before they adjourn, the rules also say the president has 10 days to sign it. If in that 10-day window, Congress adjourns, if the president still has not signed the bill, then it, it's, it's counted as, as rejected. This is called the pocket veto. It's as if the president puts it in his pocket, waits for Congress to go, and then, and then tosses it in the trash. That's what Lincoln's going to do. Okay? So he uses this pocket veto. He has his own plan for Reconstruction. Lincoln's plan for Reconstruction we call uh, Lincoln's 10% plan. You'll see why here in just a minute. See, in Lincoln's interpretation of the Civil War, he said the South hadn't actually seceded, so there's no need for a readmission. That's a, that's a key difference in the thinking. Now, you know, most... People up in the North, I think, had rejected the idea of secession. The South didn't secede. They won the war. This proved they didn't secede. But still, there was this idea of, of the states needed to be made to do something. Now, Lincoln's going to make them do something, too. But his plan is, is a lot more nice uh, to the southern states than, than even Congress wanted. Now, first of all, uh, Lincoln plans to offer official pardons to all the Confederates, all the people in the South, who swear allegiance to the Union. They go in, they officially swear allegiance to the Union, reject the idea of secession. Lincoln will give them a pardon for anything they've done during the Civil War. He will set aside the main Confederate leaders and say, okay, these people don't get a pardon. Uh, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, those folks, that they, they can't get a pardon, but the common ordinary soldiers can. The people who carried mail can. 
Here's where we get the name for Lincoln's plan. Because once 10% of the voters in a state had done this, once 10% of the voters in the state had sworn allegiance, and now you're allowing most of the people to do it, once 10% have sworn allegiance to the Union, they can now form new state governments and essentially are back in control of their own political destinies. Lincoln would require them to do certain things, but for the most part, they are in charge. This is a huge difference from the Wade Davis bill uh, because it is so lenient. Had this happened, Reconstruction would have been, I'll say here, relatively quick because Reconstruction is going to last from 1865 to 1877, so this is going to be a 12-year Reconstruction. Um, probably would have ended a little bit sooner. And there's the huge potential that Lincoln would have gotten the North to fund it at least in the first few years when Lincoln was still president. However, Lincoln's assassination changes everything. When this man becomes president, Andrew Johnson, if you remember back to your notes at the end of the Civil War, hey, in 1864, when Lincoln is running for re-election, the Republicans replace his first vice president with Andrew Johnson. Hey, this was a political move. Andrew Johnson was a Southern Democrat from the state of Tennessee. But Andrew Johnson was pro-Union. And so this was, in part, a way to reward him for his loyalty to the Union. He had not gone with Tennessee when Tennessee seceded. He remained with the Union. And so he's now president. And this is kind of a good thing because even though he's a Southern Democrat, he's also uh, very much against the plantation-owning uh, aristocracy that ran everything in the South. He had a lot of animosity toward them. He didn't come from their social class. He married into their social class. And, and they kind of never let him forget his humble beginnings. Well, now he's president, and they are in severe trouble because they have just lost this war. They have to come to him. Now, the bad thing about Andrew Johnson is he still has that Southern Democrat mentality of slavery was a benefit. He was voting with the, the pro-slavery side before the Civil War. He just didn't believe in secession. He's going to believe that African Americans are inferior, he is a racist, but now he's president. And he adopted a plan very similar to Lincoln's plan. Uh, the difference was Lincoln was going to require the South to do certain things, and Lincoln wasn't going to allow the main Confederate leaders to, to participate in this. Uh, Johnson does. So it's even more lenient than what Lincoln wanted. He's going to offer pardons to a whole lot of Confederate leaders, um, some of them included, you know, the the main leader, like the, the vice president of the Confederacy, uh, received a pardon. And as far as Johnson was concerned, by the end of 1865, uh, the southern states have been have completed Reconstruction, as far as he was concerned. They, they were done. They, they were good to go. Uh, the only one that was still dragging its feet was Mississippi. Everybody else was readmitted. And so, under... Johnson, the southern states, they, they start to form their, their new governments in what the North is going to refer to as the Johnson governments, because this is not what they wanted. When Andrew Johnson gave all these guys pardons, uh, all of a sudden they, they had all the rights and privileges that went along uh, with being a citizen, which meant they could not only vote, but they could also run for office. And so in a lot of the southern states, their post-Civil War governments were taken over through elections, by those Southern Democrats that had started the Civil War, that had led the Confederacy. And so, you know, we've got the same people running the show. They've been running the show for decades. And so uh, these new governments, these Johnson governments, started enacting uh, these laws all over the South uh, that came to be called the Black Codes. If you remember the Slave Codes uh, that we've mentioned earlier uh, hopefully in U.S. history class, uh, the rules that govern slavery, well, these are going to be the rules that govern African Americans throughout the South. The Black Codes uh, deny African Americans the right to vote. 
there are a whole variety of rights and liberties that we take for granted that became uh, that were taken away uh, from the former slaves who are going to be known as uh, the freedmen. Okay? Things like uh, if you owed someone money, you were not allowed to leave town. If you, if you were planning on moving, even if it was just one town over, you had to prove that you didn't owe anyone a debt. For a lot of the freedmen, you know, I mean, once you come off the plantation, what do you have? You have been a slave your entire life. You don't have much. And so some of the, the Southerners would, you know, maybe give them clothing, allow them to work. You know, I can't pay you, but, but here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to work this out. And a lot of the former slaves ended up in conditions that the people up in the North, when they heard about them, they said, they said this is no better than slavery. This is, this, is, this is slavery by a different name. Let's look at this picture here real quick. What do, what do we have here? We have, a, we have a crowd out here. And we have this guy. Looks like looks like he might be trying to trying to, to talk to somebody up here. We've got uh, this guy who's addressing the crowd. Here we've got an African American gentleman, a freedman, a freedman. And what's, what's what's this? He's tied up. He's he's chained up. What is this? Okay, tell you ask yourself what what is this? It looks like a slave auction. It is not. This is a depiction of someone who is being uh, auctioned off to pay, to work off a debt. Okay? This is somebody who owes a debt. Back in the day, you could be arrested if you owed a debt and you weren't paying it. The jail, this is, this is our jailer who is taking bids on who wants to rent him for the day, the week, however long. That money will then be used to pay off his debt. In the meantime, he is going to work for, for one of these people, whoever it is, whoever it is that, that pays for him. But the thing is, what they're going to do is they're going to end up setting these guys up in a cycle where they can't get out of that poverty. And so it just perpetuated itself. And so, you know, people up in the north, by the time they get to the end of 1865, early part of 1866, they're looking at the conditions in the south and they're saying, wait, wait hold on, I thought we won. I thought we ended that. What, what's going on here? When Johnson said the southern states were readmitted, well, they had the ability to send people to Congress. And the southern states are going to start sending some of those ex-Confederate leaders back to Congress. Uh, Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, was sent back uh, to act as a senator from Georgia. And when these people show up in Congress and, and Congress, you know, sees these guys coming in, these guys that, that, you know, five years before had stormed out saying, we are seceding, we don't want to be part of your country, we're going to go start a war. And now they're coming back in, Congress... Uh, refused to seat the representatives and the senators coming from the South. They, they said, we are not going to deal with this. And this sets up a showdown between Johnson and Congress. Okay. Congress is going to be dominated by these folks we call the Radical Republicans. The Radical Republicans are the, are the, the ones who, before the Civil War, they had been for you know immediate uh uncompensated emancipation uh, for the slaves. They are now uh, taking over, and you know, we call them radical Republicans, and maybe that makes them sound crazy. Uh, but some of the things they wanted was they wanted to make sure that the rights of the freedmen were protected. And they wanted to make sure that ex-Confederates would have no future say in the government because they had started this war. Some of the big leaders of the radical Republicans in Congress, uh, Senator Charles Sumner, He's returned from his convalescence. Uh, he is, if you remember from the, the caning of Charles Sumner where Preston Brooks uh, nearly beat him to death before the Civil War. And then the House of Representative Thaddeus Stevens, who's from Pennsylvania. Okay. So these radical Republicans, part of what they want to do is punish the South. You must be punished for this great evil that you have done, the Civil War. But at the same time, they also wanted uh, 
uh, to protect the freedmen from what was going on. So, in 1866, Congress uh, starts the ball rolling, and they're going to pass two laws. The first one is the creation of something called the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, the Freedmen's Bureau is a government agency. Its purpose, its original purpose, was to provide assistance to the freedmen. This, this was uh, providing them with, with ways to get education, providing them with legal representation, uh, providing them with some of the basics of, of life, you know, clothing and blankets and food and whatever else. It was originally created as part of the army. As the army moved through the South, freeing the slaves during the Civil War, uh, they also found that there were a lot of the poor whites in the South that were in the exact same condition as the freedmen. And so uh, that's often overlooked when we talk about the Freedmen's Bureau. We Questions on, on tests usually talk about it's designed to provide assistance to the freedmen, uh, but it did also help the poor whites as well. They're also going to pass a law called the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which is designed to protect the civil rights of African Americans from actions of the state government. So Congress passes these two laws. President Johnson vetoes both of them. Okay, President Johnson, uh, his, his argument for vetoing the Freedmen's Bureau is that it's not the job of the federal government to provide for people. That's, that should be state and local. Um, his argument for vetoing the Civil Rights Act of 1866 is that it's not the job of the government to protect people's rights. That's also the job of the states. You know, do you really think Mississippi's going to do that? Sorry, Mississippi. If you're watching, apologize. Just using you as an example. But anyway, Johnson vetoes both of these. Now, the radical Republicans, of course, are upset with him, but it also upset people that we're going to call moderate Republicans. People, people that, are, that are, you know, they, they, oh, let's not punish the South. Let's, let's be more like Lincoln. Congress overrides both of these vetoes. The president can veto a bill, but if you remember from, from our foundations of government, uh, Congress can override a veto with two-thirds of both houses. And so Congress overrode both of those vetoes. This is seriously important in history because this is the, these are the first pieces of major legislation that a president has vetoed and Congress has overridden that veto. And up in the North, this is what people start to think of uh, when they start thinking of, of President Johnson up here. Okay? Here's President Johnson. Okay? He's got his suffrage veto. He's vetoing somebody's right to vote. Okay? Probably our... Friedman over here, who's casting his vote for Mayor Welch, wherever this was. Okay. But look at who's standing right next to, right behind Johnson. Okay. Hopefully you can read up here at the top of his hat. XCSA. Ex-Confederate. And so they start to place Johnson in league with the Confederates. At least that was that's the perception. In 1866, we had an election. This is this is an off-year election. Okay? What that means is uh, this: we're not electing the president. Okay? In off-year elections, uh, we elect all the members of the House of Representatives. We elect one third of the members of the Senate. And so, in 1866, what's up for grabs is control of Congress. And President Johnson is going to go on a campaign tour around the North uh, that they called the Swing Around the Circle. Johnson goes through the northern states uh, campaigning for moderate Republicans and Democrats, saying, you know, you, you voters, you need, to, you need to vote for these people. You need to send them to Washington so I can get my Reconstruction plan done. Now, the radical Republicans, they're going to counter by campaigning uh, through what we call waving the bloody shirt. It gets its name from a campaign rally in uh, Ohio where someone went and they brought back a blood-stained Union uniform, a supposedly blood-stained Union uniform. And they held that uniform up to the crowd and they said, basically, do you remember what the Democrats did? Don't let them get back into power. Trying to remind voters that it's Democrats who started the war. 
It's Southern Democrats that had fought the war against the North. It was Republicans that had fought to preserve the Union. And those two things, okay, those two things, the waving the bloody shirt, Johnson going on the swing around the circle, okay, seeming to end up being allied with uh, the former Confederates. Okay, those things help the radical Republicans who end up winning uh, two-thirds of the seats in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. It takes two-thirds in both houses to override a veto. So if either party ever has this, this is called a veto-proof majority. Congress can, if the, the radical Republicans decide to start passing legislation, Johnson can veto it all day long. Congress can override it. They have the numbers. Okay, so this is a huge thing for Congress. And so Congress is going to take over Reconstruction. So we refer to this period as Congressional Reconstruction or Radical Reconstruction. And again, using that word radical has some negative connotations to it. But Congress is going to take over. One of the first things they do is they take away the right to vote from the people who ran the Confederacy. They take away their right to vote. They take, take away their, their right to hold office. You started the Civil War. You fought the Civil War. You cannot hold office anymore. They're going to cut the South up into military districts. And so I've got a, our map here of the military districts. Each one of these had a general who is in charge and is going to sign off on it. There will be, I'm going to go ahead and use this illustration. There will be military occupation of the South. I'm going to say it that direction, that, that way, because it kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. There's soldiers stationed throughout the South. And then Congress is going to require the southern states to do a number of things prior to readmission. And Congress would, they would assign them tasks to do, and then they would assign them more tasks to do. So there's a series of Reconstruction Acts. We're not going to go through all the Reconstruction Acts. That's getting lost in the weeds. Right, but some of the things that they were required to do, they were required to write new state constitutions. They had to set up new, new governments. Many of them had set up, the structure-wise would be the same as it had been before the war. Uh, but they have to do, create that. They have to renounce secession. Southern states uh, must admit that there is no such thing as secession, that, that states can't leave. They also had to guarantee and protect by law the rights of the freedmen within their, within their states. Congress would also, under one of the Reconstruction Acts, they would require the southern states to ratify the 14th Amendment. They would later require them to ratify the 15th Amendment. Okay. The 13th, while I'm here, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, these are called the Civil War Amendments, sometimes the Reconstruction Amendments. Okay? The 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment guaranteed citizenship uh, to the former slaves and anyone born or naturalized in the United States. And then the 15th Amendment guaranteed the right of African Americans to vote. That guaranteed the right of all men to vote. Now, President Johnson... Even though Congress is passing all these things, President Johnson is trying to stop it. He's trying to delay it. Anything he had control over, uh, he would try uh, to throw a monkey wrench in all this. And so Johnson is trying to cause problems for Congress. And so Congress finally gets sick and tired of it, and Congress says, okay, we're going to get rid of Johnson. How? They pass a law called the Tenure of Office Act. The Tenure of Office Act requires the Senate to approve anyone that the president wants to fire from the cabinet. Okay? When the president uh, appoints someone to the cabinet, the Senate has to approve. This is saying, look, if the president wants to get rid of somebody from the cabinet, well, we approved him, so, so we have to approve him getting rid of them. President Johnson doesn't believe this is constitutional. And to be perfectly honest, it probably isn't. Okay? These people serve at the pleasure of the president. That's, that's kind of always understood. And so Johnson is going to challenge the Tenure of Office Act by firing his Secretary of War. Well, Edwin Stanton was Lincoln's Secretary of War. Edwin Stanton uh, started out as a Democrat and had, by this point, become a radical Republican. He wanted to punish the South, too, so he and Johnson were butting heads. And so Johnson says, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to fire you and I'm going to challenge this law. Well, because Johnson has violated the law, 
the House of Representatives impeaches President Johnson. It takes a majority, takes a that's all it takes, a simple majority of members of the House of Representatives to impeach President Johnson. He is then put on trial in the Senate. And the Senate will decide, is he guilty? Does he need to be removed? After his trial in the Senate, the Senate votes 35 to 19 to remove President Johnson. And that's one vote short. The vote needed to be 36 to 18. And it was one vote short. And so President Johnson is going to remain in office. However, this totally weakens not only Johnson, but the entire presidency. Okay? The Congress has proved that if they don't like you, they can force an impeachment vote, and they can get pretty close. And so it kind of guarantees Congress's control over Reconstruction. It's going to have more far-reaching uh, implications in the next unit when, when Congress is essentially is essentially the most powerful branch of government through the latter part of the 1800s. And so all this goes down, but Congress does end up in charge, and Congress is going to, while Congress is in charge of Reconstruction, there are some good things that are going to happen in the South. Okay. Politically, during Reconstruction, the Southern states do set up and establish a more equitable or equal tax system. Prior to the Civil War, the large plantation owners had exempted themselves from the higher taxes that, that in all fairness they should have been paying. Politically during Reconstruction, African Americans have their rights protected because the military is here. And the military is guaranteeing they have uh, the right to vote. Economically, uh, northern businesses and northern banks are encouraged uh, to invest, and they want to invest in the South. Okay? Uh, one of the things that they wanted to invest in was, was railroad construction. And so this would be of economic benefit to the South. Socially, you know, we also have a couple of positive aspect, aspects. Uh, the southern states are required to create public schools uh, for the freedmen, well, many of the southern states say if, if we have to educate the freedmen, why not the poor whites? And so they create a system of public schools uh, to educate all of their citizens. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, well, that's not a good thing. Well, it, it really is. You know, we, we need to teach everybody how to, you know, read, write, and do math. Socially, also, uh, for everyone, not just the freedmen, but also, also uh, the poor and middle class whites, there's more social mobility. Than there was. You're, you're not born into a, a class, basically, is, is what happened in the South before the Civil War. I tell you all these because in the aftermath of Reconstruction, when the, when the South finally got to control its own destiny again, um, the South does a very good job of rewriting history. Depending on where you are and what conversations you have, uh, you know, that's one of the things, you know, you don't rewrite history, you can't rewrite history. Well, rewriting Southern history starts as soon as Reconstruction's over. Because Reconstruction is going to be billed as a great evil that was visited upon the South by a vengeful, vindictive North. And that story was told to such a great extent that even people up in the North believed it. Oh, what we did to the South was so horrible and cruel and wrong, and we were just sore winners. And in reality, here are some of our positives. Uh, these are great, wonderful things that are happening during Reconstruction. I hope that helps make Reconstruction make sense to you. There is an entire second half. Hey, this, is, this was the, the early parts and the good parts of Reconstruction. What you still have to go through is, is how it ended up failing. And that's a whole other lesson that will set up what goes on in the South a hundred years later. So pay attention to that when it comes up. Thanks for watching.